Hello everybody. So um, we're going to be working on the file system uh, this time. This is going to be the beginner uh, version of the file system. So we're going to try to do it all in the GUI. However, I do have a terminal in the background just in case that I come up with anything I want to show you guys mid-video. Something a little off script, but um, I don't think so. Uh, so the last video I did was for the advanced series and it was a bit gained out. Hopefully that is fixed in this video. Um, I didn't have time to re-record it so uh, and still make this video so I was like well let's just get the video out. It's better to put it out there and it's not so bad that it's like unbearable. You know you can still hear what I'm saying. It's just not perfect. So for those of you just watching the, uh, the beginner series you probably won't know what that even what I'm talking about so hopefully that uh, hopefully everything works anyway let's dive into the video so we don't come up with something super long um, uh, basically what I want to talk about is the Linux file system how it generally works where things go one of the biggest questions I get in Linux from new people is where is program files where are my files going like when I install a program where does it go uh, and the answer is all over the place kind of um, that's why file. Uh, that's why uh, package managers are so important because they micromanage all that for you, so you really don't have to think about where a file is going. However, it is kind of a nice thing to know. So I was hoping today that I could break down the file system a little bit for you guys and explain a bit about where things are going and what your file system really looks like. In the more advanced video, I'll talk a bit more about mounting remote file systems and um, you know the nuances of all that and you know file system um, uh, you know the different kinds of files hard linking soft linking um, sim links all, all that sim links are soft links but anyway all that sort of stuff will be in the next video uh, I also want to mention for those of you watching the series uh, I totally combine the SSH videos and the command line uh, advanced video um, I went from intermediate to advanced and just called it terminal advance, advanced and combined those two videos together. Sort of on a happy accident, I guess, um, but that's why that video is so long. Uh, so if you're on the beginner series and you're not watching the advanced series, you won't know about that and that won't apply to you. But if you're watching the entire series um, from beginning to end, then uh, that is what happened there. So we're basically skipping the SSH video because there's not a lot more to really talk about that. Maybe I'll get more into SSH later on, but for the most part, I'm hoping I covered the basics of that enough that people can kind of uh, build off of that. Um, so let's get into the file system. So uh, when you open your uh, file manager, in my case here it's Dolphin, that's the one for KDE, but you can use you know GNOME or anyone that has a file manager. Pretty much all the the, I, um, the GUI user interfaces, graphical interfaces do um, have a file manager. So you can see it will open up to your home directory which is essentially sort of like the windows users directory um, c colon users or c colon slash users or whatever in windows nowadays it used to be documents and settings but now it's users um, and then in there you have your different user accounts and in there you've got all your documents and your game data and you know you've got that hidden app data folder and all that Debian or Linux in general tend to work basically the same way if they conform to the standard file system format that most Linux dis distributions adhere to. Um, so this will apply to more or less all the distributions out there. Um, there are a handful that do things a little differently. So in your uh, home directory, you'll see here that you have uh, you know, documents, downloads, music, pictures. This is essentially your profile. This is where all your stuff goes, right? Um, and I can actually uh, remove all of this stuff because that was, oops, um, that was there for my last video. So we can drop all this. This will not be here by default. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, so this is the standard stuff you generally will see when you first start it up. Some distributions may have some different things in there, and depending on how you install Debian, you may or may not get uh, standard folders. Um, you know, but if you install the desktop environment, you should get the standard folders. Um, so, what is above this? 
Okay, well actually first let's talk about what's actually in here because this is not everything that's in here. It looks like it is, but it's not. You have some hidden files. So as I've said before, directories or files or folders or whatever that start with a dot character are hidden files. You can't normally see them. So in KDE's Dolphin, I drop down and I hit, uh, uh, I bulleted uh, hidden files, which shows hidden files. So you can see I've got some more stuff in here. I have a dot config directory that has some configuration files. Um, a lot of this stuff is like for KDE. But there are certain other things that will end up in here as well from various programs throughout your system. You may end up with some extra stuff in here if you install uh, certain things. And there's also a good place where you can drop your own custom config files, like if you're writing you know, your own sort of stuff or you know, you're adding a config file to the system, you can drop it in here, feel free. Um, you know, maybe make your own subdirectory so you don't risk getting overwritten in case your file has the same name or something. Um, but yeah, so that's the config directory. It's got basic configurations that apply to your own profile, but it's not the only place configurations really are. There's also the .local directory, and inside .local you've got share. Oops, went down one too far. Uh, so in here you're going to have some more KDE stuff like the Akandi, I guess that's how you pronounce it, Akandi, Akandi, um, Akandi maybe, uh, Blue, you know, uh, different things like that. Um, the important thing is you may have an applications folder. It does not look like I have an applications folder though. So let's make one real quick. So if you right click on your uh, KDE application launcher here, if you're in KDE, if you're in other distributions, you may be able to ignore this part of the video. But in here we can just go like, I don't know, utilities. And we'll just add a new item and we'll call it test whatever it doesn't really matter we just need a new item in here and we'll save that and now if uh, if we look we should have an applications this is where your local applications uh, dot desktop files go for your user so essentially that test thing we just made is only going to show up on your user if you make um, a new user on the system and log in they're not going to see that test dot 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 desktop um, so <clears throat> that is uh, that's something that you can uh, kind of use to manage your, um, your your start menu with essentially because that's basically what this is is your main menu as I guess we tend to call it in Linux the kicker menu as it used to be called in KDE I'm not sure if they still use that but that's what it was called at one time um, but uh, yeah so if you look in here and we go to what do we, what do we put it in utilities I think you'll see test in here or at least you should let's see uh, do we put it in utility? Oh no, it went in development for some reason. That's weird. I thought I put it in utilities. I guess uh, I guess I was bulleted for development. Why is it in development? It's really strange. I thought it was in utilities. Whatever. We'll drag it to utilities. Um. Yeah, right there. All right. So let's try that again, shall we? Okay. Applications, utilities, and we should have a test in here. So scroll down. Uh, maybe not because I didn't fill it all the way out. I would think it would be in here though. Hmm. Okay, so command will be echo test. Let's get some stuff here. You can set an icon for it too. Um, and we'll just do other icons and make it a Debian logo. Why not? All right, let's see what we get. Let's actually type test. Yeah, there's test. Okay, so there's test. And it should be under utilities because that's where we put it, so let's take a look. There it is, okay, so there's test. Yeah, we just needed to fill it out a little bit more for it to appear. <clears throat> I guess it needs a command at least. Um, and so, and you can see the icons actually changed here too, which is kind of cool. Um, we can go ahead and remove that though, because I don't want to actually leave that there. I'm going to save it, and you'll see it goes away in here. Um, where's the refresh? I'll just do F5. F5 should refresh, I think. No, maybe not. Uh, reload. There it is. Yeah, it's F5. Weird. Huh, for some reason removing it did not actually remove it like, entirely. That's fine. We can re remove it that way. Um, and then, and then it will no longer appear in your start menu. 
So um, that is uh, one of the things that you should know. There's also like um, images I think you can get in there. So if you go like right click on your desktop and you do configure desktop, in here you can do get new wallpapers. And if you do that, um, it will find some new wallpapers. If you install any one of these, it doesn't really matter. You'll notice a new folder has appeared in here and it should be... Um, where'd I go? Um, I think it's actually wallpapers, not images. Yep, there it is, wallpapers, okay. Um, so that will give you, um, that's where your wallpapers are stored essentially. <clears throat> uh, and then you have uh, Steam, if you have it, may have some stuff in here. SDDM is your login manager. So you probably don't need to mess with that. That's just a log. Um, but yeah, so this is basically where the stuff generally about KDE, but other things as well can be in there like applications and just anything can store stuff in .local. It's basically like a big settings folder. Sort of similar in nature to config, I guess. I really don't know why they're two different things, but they are. Um, you may also have some other things in here like dbus and gconf and all that. Uh, gconf stuff is like for GTK stuff, so GNOME. Uh, that can be installed in KDE. Um, systems and the reason why that's generally like that is if you do decide to run a GTK application it allows GTK to be themed for KDE so that the applications look native and, and nothing it doesn't look jarring it doesn't look like you're running two different systems also note that if you have Firefox installed this is where your Mozilla profile is and here you can look at your um, you know your Firefox stuff um, extensions etc um, and yeah, here's the profile. So that's your Firefox profile right there, and your profile.ini, profiles.ini, which tells Firefox where the profiles are and what to look for, etc. Um, so that is where you can manipulate that at. That's kind of cool. Uh, you also have a .ssh, which we covered in the last video, which is where SSH unique configurations and your SSH keys will go if you are SSHing from one system to another. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I say SSH, don't worry about it. This is a beginner series for a reason, so you're fine. Um, you also have these files, which are like your bash history. So if you do enter commands into the terminal, you'll get a history that will generate there. If you have a special terminal installed like ZSH instead of bash, for instance, you'll have a ZSH history as well. Um, you also have the bash RC, which is essentially your, your terminal configuration file uh, for your profile. Your dot profile, which is uh, special, unique, extra stuff that's just configured for your profile. So you can go in there and tell it, like, I want this to launch when my computer starts and stuff like that. You can use that to do weird stuff like that, although that's not the recommended way to do it. If you're in KDE, um, you can do that in your system settings. Uh, and that, that would be the better way to go about that. <clears throat> um, your X authority file is actually a file that contains, um, it, it's essentially uh, um, part of the mechanism that prevents your computer, uh, other users on your computer from connecting to your X session, so your window management system. Um, it basically means that other users are not going to be able to connect to your X session and see like what's running on your desktop and um, and be able to launch applications on your desktop for you and random stuff like that. That can be turned off. I, I think we might talk about that in a different video, but, um, but that is the file that sort of helps control that. Uh, if you delete that file, you, you'll, well, yeah, think, think, things can get interesting, I guess. Um, but yeah, so that is uh, essentially what that is. Um, and uh, so let's let's look at what is above this. So let's take a look at root. So in Linux, essentially, um, and I can maybe if I have it installed. Do I have it installed? Tree? Nope. If you're not a terminal person, just bear with me. Okay, there we go. Tree, right? So uh, tree shows you the breakdown of your hard drive. So let's do tree from root. And that's actually gonna be gnarly. So let's not do tree from root, man tree. Uh, I think it might be depth maybe. Uh, what is it? Recursive pattern level. Okay, tack L. So let's do, um, let's do tree tack L and we'll give it maybe three levels deep. Uh, okay, let's go two levels deep. That's a little better. Okay. So this is sort of the file system tree. Ooh, wow, maybe that's not better. Yeah, that's not better. Let's go one level deep. 
So this is the file system tree, right? This is the main uh, directory. So this would be root, which is where we are. So it's represented by a dot here, but typically it's represented by a slash, okay? So if you look, this is root. So this is essentially the same places right here, right? Um, so in your root directory, you'll notice there's a bin folder, there's a bin folder, a boot folder, a boot folder, a dev folder, a dev folder, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to talk about a few of these folders. I won't get like too crazy with it because I don't want to make this video like hours and hours long, but I'll talk about the big ones. Um, so the most important ones, boot is generally where your kernel boot stuff happens at. Um, so essentially you have uh, these image files, which are the Linux kernels. Um, but this is the ones, these are the ones that are actually running. Those are just symlinks, I think. Um, to these, I want to say, uh, it's not something I mess with very often, but Grub is in here. Grub is the Grand Unified Bootloader. That's actually the program that's responsible for booting your system um, initially. So it's what initializes the thing and draws that menu at the very beginning when you're booting up. If you have more than one OS or uh, more than one kernel installed, you'll see more than one entry. That's Grub. Um, and it is responsible for handing your boot process off to the init system, which then finishes up the rest of the way, essentially. Um, and uh, so that's in your boot drive, right? Uh, bin is uh, binaries. And these are like top level critical system binaries. A lot of Linux systems have gone to symlinking bin and, um, and also lib uh, over to user. So you'll see user bin and user lib. So uh, the old school way to do it is the way Debian is still doing it. I think Debian is gonna go that way, but I don't think they have yet because I'm pretty sure this is definitely just a folder, not a symlink. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm honestly not positive if they're gonna take that route or not. I'm not really sure how I feel about that route because I think as of now, user can still be, um, USR can still be moved off onto its own disk but I think once they do that sim linking thing, it's it's not you can't really do that anymore. So there are pros and cons to that method. Um, but um, but basically, bin is like critical stuff that your system cannot live without. It's really really you know top level binaries, just just really um, important binaries that your system needs uh, in order to boot up and do basic functionality. If something happens to your bin folder, your system probably won't boot anymore. Or at the very least, if it does get up, I'm not sure what will actually happen, whether or not it will come up or not, but you'll have a very chopped down system that won't be able to do a lot. Uh, lib is supporting libraries of those bins, so it's shared libraries. So in Linux, there is the concept of shared libraries, which means two different programs can share a library of code in order to uh, for both of them to utilize that shared library. What that does is, is it dramatically cuts down on the storage cost of each subsequent program. For instance, the first time you install a particular piece of software on your system, if it's the first system that uses said library, it's going to come down with that with that program. So that program may be, you know, 50 megs or, you know, some much bigger number, right? Arbitrary, it doesn't matter. Um, but it, it's bigger. But then the next time you install another program that uses similar libraries, rather than pull them down again, it will simply use a shared library. So that program, even though if you installed it first would have been huge, it's now much smaller because it's just using shared libraries and it does not need to reinstall all of those. It can just use them. So that's what's nice about shared libraries. That technique or that concept is sort of broken when you start talking about things like, um, like zero install or snaps or whatever, they tend to package all their libraries together more like what Windows does. And then you end up with a program that sits on there and it's got all the stuff that it needs to run just packaged in it. So they're bigger. Um, and that's why they're universal, but they're bigger. So they lose the advantage of having shared libraries to make the system smaller, more nimble and faster um, and more integrated. Uh, that's also why uh, versions in Debian tend to be frozen in time until the next big Debian release because if you update all the shared libraries, you got to update all the software. Or if you update the software, it may be missing a shared library that it requires to run. So there's that. Uh, Lib64 is just 64-bit libraries, I think. Um, so that's fine. Uh, home is obviously your home directory. That's where your different user accounts are located, um, or at least the profiles for your different user accounts are located. So if I had more than one user, they would be there. 
Uh, Etsy is system-wide config files. So ETC is system-wide config files. If you want to make a global change to the configuration of your system, this is where it's generally going to happen. Um, you know, this is where your SSH configs are. This is where, um, you know, just in general, all of your different configuration files are for your for your system on a global perspective. Um, fun note: also, there are some files of here uh, that are that are of interest specifically, uh, and the first of those is Etsy. PASSWD. Um, that is the password file and it's not really where passwords are stored. It used to be way back in the day on older Linux systems, but newer Linux systems don't do that. This is actually where the user accounts are stored. So if we look at that, and I'll just do it in the terminal because it's fast, I can add it, Etsy PASSWD, you can see that it will output all of the user accounts that are on the system. Now this may look like a nightmare to look through, but really it's not too bad once you kind of understand what's going on here. So basically what you have is this is my main user account. Now why are there so many accounts when I only have one user? These are system accounts. They're for different programs that are running on the computer. Um, apparently www-data is there, even though that's an Apache one, and I don't think the system has Apache on it, so that's kind of interesting. I don't know why that's there. Um, maybe I installed it at one point for another video or something. Uh, but anyways, the important thing is this is my user account, right? So this is my username, Joe. This is my um, this is my um, uh, UID and GID. So you know, Joe, Joe, right? Um, basically, that's the the user ID number and the GID or group ID number. This is the accurate representation of my name. So, you know, J with Joe with a capital J. So like if I wanted to put my full name there, it would it would say, you know, my full name. Um, this is your home directory, right? And this is your default shell, your root shell, right? Um, so if we take a look at the other file, which is Etsy Shadow. This is where oops, this is where your passwords are actually stored. So if I do sudo, the password to this system, by the way, is just password. So it, it, this isn't a big secret. I'm not like revealing secret ninja stuff here. Um, so you can see that these are these are uh, systems that don't have a, or, uh, accounts. I'm sorry, that don't have a password, which means you're not going to be able to log into them directly, right? Root has a password on this system, so you can log in directly as root provided you have direct access to the shell. You're not allowed, SSH isn't even running on this box. Um, if you remove the root password, you will not be able to log in as root, but you could still use like sudo to elevate to root, for instance. Um, so this is actually the, uh, the, the key to the password. Um, and this is the, um, I'm sorry, this is the encrypted key for the password, basically. It's, it's the encrypted password, um, and, and when you log in, it it obviously runs your what you type in with your password through that same algorithm. And if the keys match, the, if these encrypted hashes match, then you know you're good. Um, it is salted, so you know you're not going to come up with the same password. Even if two people use the same password, the salt will make it different. Um, this is actually constraints on the password, which you can actually see with the CHH program. But I'm not going to go into all of that because of uh, the fact that this is a beginner video. I may show that in the advanced version though if you guys are interested. Um, so I just wanted to show the contents of that um, really, really quickly because that's interesting stuff um, for people who are interested in, in user accounts. If you want to manage users through the, um, through the normal UI though, uh, in KDE anyway, it's in system settings. And then um, in here you should have, I think it's accounts. Accounts. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, maybe it's account. Yeah, it's account details. Um, in here, you have user manager, and you can click new user, and you can give them a password, etc., and so forth. Uh, you can also set up your KDE wallet, which is sort of like a password manager for KDE. Uh, anyway, so that is, um, and GNOME has a similar process. You just go in and add users that way, so you don't have to do it through the terminal. Absolutely not. So let's take a look at other directories. So that was Etsy. Um, so dev is device. So this is where your devices are. So like if you if you have a hard drive or a thumb drive you attach to your system, it's going to appear in here first. That's the device. That doesn't mean that's where it's mounted at, so it won't be accessible from there. But that's the actual hardware device file. Because in Linux, everything is a file. 
even devices. So essentially speaking, um, all of your devices are going to be in here, including your terminals. These are the TTY sessions and the PTY, or I'm sorry, it is PT, PTS. This is this is other terminal sessions that are existent. Um, and uh, and you have, you know, just these are all your different devices. Um, I, I don't really know what a, much else of what to say to that. Um, Urandom is interesting because it generates random information, um, you know, and, and you can use it in code to, to mess with that. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a very important directory, so to speak. Um, let's go up to root and we'll look at the next one. So we've covered home, Etsy, dev, boot, bin. I've touched on live and live 64. Uh, media is like where your CD-ROMs map, map to. So if you put in a thumb drive, it's going to appear in media. Um, so if you're creating your own mount points, like an NTFS, I don't use media for that. I use MNT for that. MNT is like um, a space where you can map stuff manually if you want, uh, which we'll get into in a different video probably. This is not going to cover remote systems. Opt is a place where you can sideload applications. So yours may be blank and that's fine. I've actually installed, um, I think this is a newer version of Firefox. I don't know what this is, but anyway. So I've at one point or another installed Firefox on this system, sideloaded style from Opt. Um, if you extract a program there and then you sim link it into the right places, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, you can make it launch. You can actually create, uh, uh, um, like if you come down here and you right click on um, on the on the menu icon here and you'll get this little sub menu and you can edit applications which in here you could uh, you know do internet and then do a new item and then do like firebox and then you could do opt firefox firefox and uh, and then we can do like this, I think. Let's see, root, opt, Firefox, Chrome, default. Yeah, there you go. Oh, this is an old version. Okay, that's fine, whatever. Anyway, so I've just added that Firefox to our system. So if we do Firefox, we should see two of them now. This would be the new one. Yeah, so, um, And yeah, it's critically out of date. I kind of, I kind of knew that was going to happen. Yeah, this is Firefox 58, so I don't even think this is technically quantum, but it's it's uh, old school quantum. So can't believe there's already an old school quantum, but it's a thing. Um, yeah, so that is um, that is how you would sideload an application essentially. So if you're installing something from outside the package manager, uh, you would do it there. Uh, SBIN is the same as BIN, only SBIN is for root only programs. So these are programs that should only be run by root. Um, and uh, let's see, SRV is another one that isn't probably important to you, but if you're going to serve a file, like if you were going to have um, file systems you were going to export so that they could be shared to other computers, you would put them in there. Um, Temp is where temporary files are created and, and destroyed or whatever. Uh, you should never blank this out. Just don't blanketly do that. It can cause system instability. You never know what's being used by what in there. Um, but yeah, temp is that. Sys uh, is like access to system level stuff. So you can check out power and kernel stuff that's going on. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with sys. I don't want to deep dive into sys really uh, right now though because it's just too much for this video. This is a this is a beginner video. Proc is similar except it's generally limited to processes. So these folders here are PIDs actually PIDs or process IDs, and um, and you can you can see information about running processes in here. A lot of the actual utilities that you can use like in the terminal and such to to view that information, they're just reading it from there. Um, so you could manually do it, for instance, if you really knew what you were doing, you could go in there and manually discover some of that information. Um, there's also user or USR, which also has a bin file. Uh, these are bin files that are um, just common. So when you at git install a program, this is where it's going to go, generally. Okay. So again, you'll have a bin and an sbin, though, which are the same as the root level bin and sbin. Bin is for normal users or just any user to use. Sbin is for root only. 
elevated users can use S Pen. That's it. Um, games is generally unused, uh, but if you install like Minecraft or something, then uh, you may have some stuff that appears under there, especially for running like a Minecraft server. Um, but generally, there's not a lot going on in there. Um, the include directory is uh, essentially like if you were writing a program and you wanted to include a library, that's what that's for essentially. That stuff is normally stored in there. Libs again are your shared libraries for your various programs that are installed. Um, share is uh, global uh, is like a global version of that local share that dot local share that I showed you earlier. It has even more configurations that apply globally to the entire system. Um, so uh, that seems weird because we also have Etsy, but um, share is like user specific global stuff. It's weird. So like um, for instance, um, we can look for images in here, right? So images. Ooh, what did I do? I. Let's do this. I. There you go. I. Okay. Yeah, icons are in here. So you know your different icons are stored here uh, when you install them. Uh, you have images. So uh, in here, this is where like your your default uh, Debian like login backgrounds and stuff are stored in here. So if you want to uh, find one of those for whatever to set them, uh, root user share images desktop base. Uh, is where you would go to do that, and uh, there's oh, there's so much stuff in here. There's uh, there's actually an applications directory in here. Um, so let's see if I can find that. This is the global version of your uh, of your local application, your dot local shared applications folder that we created when we created that one custom app. This is the rest of the stuff that is in your uh, applications setup here. Okay, so this would be all of the other stuff essentially that is in this list, um, for the most part. So yeah, if you if you removed Firefox ESR desktop here, you would no longer see it in that menu down there. Um, so yeah, they're they're basically um, I don't know if I can open with Kate maybe. Yeah, so this is what they look like essentially. This is what a desktop file looks like if you're curious. Um, it just has an executable path. It's it's basically just a key value pair sort of thing uh, separated by an equal sign. And then this is like if you had different languages, different languages, different languages. That's all that is. Um, so and you don't even need all of the stuff in here in order to make one of these desktop files actually function. I think it literally just needs like a name and a and a command argument, and that's it. But obviously, you can fill in more gaps. Um, what I normally do when I want to make one is I'll just copy one, um, and then I'll fill in what I want and delete the rest, and then that will be what it is. Categories is exactly what you might think it is. So you, you'll notice that in your in in here, right? When you go here, you've got these different sort of directories here. These are the categories. So Firefox, for instance, would be in network, or in this case, internet. They're they're mapped. So you know, they don't have to be exactly the same as what's in the list. So that's kind of unfortunate in a way, but it also provides some flexibility. Um, and web browser, you'll notice is there. So that is the little under thing right here that's under it. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of, it's, it's, it's not that bad. I mean, I guess, but the easiest way to do it is definitely right click on it. But if you're using a desktop dis, a desktop environment that's different from KDE, you may may it may be the only way to do it is to do it this way. Especially if you're using one that's really chopped down, like Awesome Window Manager or something hardcore. But if you're using that, you probably don't need the information, the basic stuff anyway. So, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to tell you guys about because I, that's pretty thorough actually. Yeah. Um, is there anything else up here? Sources for source code. Um, and then there's var. Var is like variable information. It's information that changes. So on your system, you have caches, um, like your apt caches. So if you ever wanted to understand what you installed, um, this is where that is. This is your apt cache. So things you install tend to go here. I think I've covered this in a prior video. Um, so that is where you would go if you wanted to see if that was clear or not. Um, there are commands you can actually use to clear it, so you don't really need to go in there to do that. But uh, but it's cool to know where it is. You know, I don't actually know what absolutely everything in here is, um, but um, I think these are your man pages. I want to say. Um, let's see. No. 
I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, e even I don't know what every single little directory does, but um, but yes, yeah, so that's where your app cache is, and, and var is basically just like variable data. Um, let's see, there's uh, local, um, which has nothing in it in this case. Uh, in here too, you can find sockets. So like spool has um, stuff. So if you had like a mail thing, it would like email it would be in here, and you can find your system sockets in this area. Um, opt, I guess, is like for stuff in opt. Like if, if you needed caching for programs in opt, I guess you could have it mapped there. Um, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. Um, but, uh, and, and w, yeah, I did have a web server on this thing at one point. I don't know if there still is, but there was at one point because that's where they're stored. So when you install Apache on this system, it goes to var www and then HTML is your root directory. Of course, you can configure that in your Apache configuration, but um, that's a little outside of the scope of the video. So that's the gist of it. That's where everything is generally stored. That's how the system breaks down. Um, another thing you should know about uh, the system is it all starts on root. So you'll notice there is no C drive because a lot of people ask, where's my C drive? That's not really a thing, right? Um, your file system starts at root and things are mounted to the file system. So if I wanted to make a, a mount, for instance, I would go into mount and I would create a mount point. In other words, I would create a folder. A mount point is just a folder that you plan to mount something to. And then you would tell it in your FS tab file, which is actually an Etsy. Etsy, and then if you come down here, um, there's F... Ah, it's doing it there. FS tab, yeah, there it is. So if we do open with, I think, let's do KWrite this time. I think KWrite looks a little better. Uh, yes, yeah, so if you do at the F tab, uh, this is the file you would edit. So this is essentially saying mount this hard drive with this weird UUID on root. Um, and it's an ext4 file system. And it's mounted with these parameters. And uh, it has these settings for, um, that just tells it like, uh, should I check, should I do an FS check every now and then, I think. Um, I don't remember, uh, dump pass, I think is what that is. So, um, so yeah, uh, generally you want to mount things zero, zero, unless you want to make sure it does an FS check every now and then. Um, but it's not, it's not necessary to do a one there. And it's actually faster in a lot of cases to do a zero in, in a lot of these places, but it's safer to do a one in some cases. So it does the checks when you want it to. Um, but yeah, you can see here that dev sr0 is your CD-ROM drive. It's mounted media uh, CD-ROM0, um, and it's mounted with these arguments. So um, actually, that's actually the kind of file system it is. So it's actually an ISO 9660 or UDF, um, and it's mounted user and no auto arguments, um, and it's mounted with 00. No auto just means it won't mount a boot. Um, so yeah, that's what FS tab does. So you would add an entry in there and you would tell it mount to this particular mount point in MNT, right? So all of them, like you can have a separate disk for home and all your stuff will be in home. That's normally done at setup, but you could clone home over to another disk and then delete home here and then mount it over. And you can do all kinds of crazy stuff, but basically mount points hang off of the root file system and where they are mounted will show up if you run the command mount. Um, so if I ran mount, I don't know if I've shown that in a video yet, but if I didn't, there it is. Uh, mount will show you where things are mounted, which I only show you because it is important to understand that the tree will always begin at root. So always, always, always at slash. Everything's gonna be below that. There is no C drive. The concept of a C drive is not a thing. When programs install, they install to use slash user bin, right? So user bin and the supporting stuff that installs with them, like the libraries and all that, is gonna to go to um, uh, user lib uh, or lib64 if you if you have 64-bit um, you know, stuff, uh, if, if you have a multi-arch, basically, um, I think. I'm actually not sure why this doesn't have a lib64, but uh, usually you'll see one. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the other thing, oh yeah, this is this is important too. So user, all right, so uh, root user local, you'll see there's a bin and an Etsy and all kinds of stuff in here. So bin, live, this is your stuff. So like if you make a script, you'll put it, you'll, you'll either symlink it or put it in user bin. 
Um, sbin is uh, for root, so if you put something in sbin, then root can use it. Um, if you put it in bin, then it's for users to use. Um, if you have a config file for them, you can put it in the Etsy. Um, you know, it's essentially like a clone of the upper directories. Uh, so they're all used for similar things, but they are scoped so that it is, um, I guess, for stuff you do, right? Uh, you can also use it for sideloaded applications. Like you'll notice this, this Firefox sim link here, this points to the Firefox and opt. Um, so that is, that is what that's about, right? Hopefully I didn't lose you guys on that. Hopefully you followed me okay because that's I know that can be a bit confusing. The Linux file system is definitely a gear shift from what you're used to with Windows if you're coming from Windows. Um, if you're coming from Mac, you may have less of a less of a hard time really following all this, but uh, that depends on whether or not you were getting into the inner workings of the Mac file system, which is different from Linux. So again, it's still a paradigm shift either way because Mac is Mac is Unix based, whereas Linux is you know Linux based. Hence Linux. Linux is a kernel, not an operating system. Um, so uh, you know Debian, I guess, is Linux based, whereas Mac is Unix based. Um, so it, it is it is a paradigm shift no matter which way you're going um but hopefully you know everything i told you wasn't too hard to follow and that gave you some insight into where things are on your system um all right well uh i guess this is all i'm going to do for this particular weekend um i guess i'll probably put some more videos out next weekend i hope um so hopefully you guys learned something and i'll see you in the next video